You are listening to the Religica Theo Lab podcast in the Center for Ecumenical and Interreligious Engagement at Seattle University. Trice with Religica. Today, in cooperation with the Northwest Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and the Seattle University Center for Religious Wisdom and World Affairs at STM, I'm speaking today with Diane Jacobson, who's Professor Emerita of Old Testament at Luther Seminary, having taught there from 1982 to 2010. She also served as director of the Book of Faith Initiative for the ELCA until 2016. Today, we're speaking about wisdom, literature that changes our lives and how we become creative in responding to the challenges of our moment. Take a listen. Okay, my name is Diane Jacobson. Professionally, I'm Professor Emerita from Luther Seminary, where I taught close to 30 years, taught Old Testament and Hebrew. And then for the last eight years of my professional life, I ran the Book of Faith Initiative for the ELCA, which was really trying to open up scripture to folks in the pews. And now I'm flunking retirement. But when you think of the Book of Faith, mm-hmm. What is wisdom that's opened up in the text? What are the reservoirs of wisdom that the world requires today? How would you respond to that? Oh, my goodness. You know, one, one of the things that always kind of bowls me over and sort of took me surprised because I come from this Reformed Jewish background that didn't have anything to do with religion particularly, except as sort of an identity. But, and then I started reading scripture sort of accidentally. And scripture holds wisdom in ways that just bowl me over and take me by surprise. And it's often by starting a kind of conversation with you, that basic question that you ask about what is wisdom that's the basic question of scripture in lots of ways. What, what is wisdom? Where do you find it? How do you get there? And there's all kinds of surprising answers. And in the wisdom tradition itself, like in the book of Proverbs, there's this sense of you look for the patterns in the world and you look for the patterns around you. And then you Figure out how God's working wisely in those patterns. And then you live your life according to those patterns. So in scripture, wisdom is never just a sort of intellectual thing. It's always a, and then this is how you live your life. Wisdom is how you live out your life. And you learn wisdom through these remarkable text. We also recently spoke together about the joy of discovering ourselves in literature. What does literature do to us? How, how are these how? texts in and of themselves also sacred in a sense? You know, I was fond when I was teaching of saying how lucky I was that I wasn't a systematician because I always had a text to deal with. So I didn't have to come up with some sense of truth <laughs> outside of a text to work with. And For me, working with, that sounds like work, playing with the text, reading with a group, listening to what other people have said, and engaging with the text takes you in places you don't expect. So you engage with a story in very different ways than you engage with something systematic. You think about characters and how they're like you or how they aren't like you. And you think about what times there are and where this takes place. And it brings you to a place that's other than yourself, but it still calls on your own experience as well. So literature does that. Poetry does that too in different ways. One of my favorite 
forms of poetry are laments because they take they they tell the truth about how you're feeling and then take that someplace poetically take it to god i, I think right now in our covid situation Lament is the perfect literature because we're, we don't know what to do. And laments somehow carry us when we don't know what to do. Lament is a form of wisdom, though, too, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm actually, one of the things that I find very interesting is when you think about laments, not just in Psalms, but say in the book of Job or something like that, a lament is a part of the theology of the cross. Now that's sort of a complicated thought, but by what I mean, what I mean by that is that through laments, you're always telling the truth. You don't cover it up. You don't pretend. You don't have some idea about what you should say. You just say, this is my life. And here's how I see suffering and I see pain. Now, God, I'm giving this to you. What do I do with this? And that's, that's a wise way. And often, laments start with questions. And as you know, I love questions. Well, and I've wondered at times if we've also concealed wisdom in literature with easier explanations that make it feel more palatable to us. So for instance, the second redacted ending of Job, the book of Job in the Hebrew scriptures, where he receives everything back and is the epitome of the suffering servant, does something, maybe? I think you're right, but there are even surprises in that second really very, uh, like, we don't like this ending because things don't turn out nicely. But actually, there are a few differences and if you notice the few differences, you say, even their life is not the same. Like his daughters get names. He prays for his enemies and a few things like that. And he's never healed. So even me, emotionally, everything, he's never entirely healed, is he? Exactly. Never in the whole book is he healed of leprosy. So he's always unclean. That's powerful. Yeah. That's really powerful. One of the things in the answer of God, I'm sorry, I can't help myself. One of the things in the answer of God in the book of Job is um, most of the animals that God's bragging about are unclean animals or they're wild. And he says, and Job, they're just like you. And those are the ones I care for. Mm. And it's sort of hidden in that response. You mentioned the pandemic with COVID-19. This is a complicated time. For a lot of people in particular who are losing jobs, who are experiencing significant instability, how do these texts help them recognize they're not alone? Uh, it's hard, I think, for a lot of people not to feel alone right now. And I would hate to say that anything automatically does that. I think one of the wonderful ways the texts do that is by when you read them together with community. Somehow, I'm loving these online Bible studies and things like that, where you can bring that together and you work with the text and it opens you up to truth, but you're not alone in doing that. And so they help you when you are working through this with others, I think. But I don't know any time that I have been feeling whatever we're feeling right now that I haven't been surprised by sitting down with scripture and letting it wash over me in some ways and then struggling together. And somehow I find that very life-giving and supporting. It's not, it's not um, easy and it's not pretty, but it's, it feels true. It feels wise. It's so, so interesting to think about what people mean and feel. I mean, uh, some people don't want to talk about God language, but they do, want, they do have a sense of the sacred. And it seems to me that it's partially in us, but it's partially also other than us. That the sacred is something bigger than we are. That knows that we are, as human beings, are flawed, and that somehow... That doesn't preclude the sacred from using us and entering into our world. Our flawedness is part of how the sacred works in our world. And that's dumbfounding 
if sacredness is not, it's not perfection, but it is a different level. It is calling us outside of ourselves too. It's calling us to something more. There's a vocational aspect to the sacred. That, that's very scriptural. When you, when you uh, talk about the Shema and Deuteronomy, uh, to love God with all your heart and soul and mind, The word for heart is also the word for mind. And we kind of separate that in our culture. We have our our emotional heart stuff and we have our intellectual mind stuff. In scripture, that's not what the separation is. You can't think something and believe something and get into it and not also act on it. So our interaction with the sacred is about living and doing as well as thinking and engaging and being wise. You can't be wise without also doing good for others. I'd like to talk to you about grief and wisdom. Is grief a creative impulse that helps us learn about ourselves and about being actively engaged in the way that wisdom wants for us? It seems to me that grief is always relational. And our encounter with the divine is always relational. So grief is a very honest really. You can't You can't have love without having grief because love's going to lead to loss. It's inevitable. It's part of how it works. So I can't quite imagine having true faith without having real grief. What the shortest verse in all of scripture, Jesus wept and it resonates. How do we get around and how do these texts help us address grief without avoiding it? Well, put it in poetry, for one thing. You express grief beautifully, and somehow that's, that goes back to your whole liturgy issue, that, you, that liturgy helps us grieve. And liturgy has patterns, and it has poetry. And I, there's something very comforting of having common words that other people use and have used in the past, and that we've known have grieved with that for centuries, that allows us to use those words for our own grief. There's something very powerful. I don't have to make up my own words for grief. I have a whole literature and a whole history of deep grief that I'm invited to participate in. That seems kind of strange, talking about participating in a history of grief, but it It seems like when you have a whole community that's been there, you know you're not alone. I think the writer is Boccacello who wrote the Decameron, but Amazon has reported recently that a 14th century text on the plague is becoming a bestseller today. Maybe for the reasons you're mentioning. There's something about not grieving alone that's required. As I come from a Lutheran tradition, one of the things that's happening right now is all of Luther's uh, writings during the plague about being his advice to his parishioners during a time of plague, suddenly those were his most popular words. They're really important now. They give us hope. Yes. That's also a source of wisdom. But to your earlier point, it's a complicated hope, isn't it? It's not a superficial hope. There's nothing superficial about it. But it's also, it's not a hope in which we know the ending and how it's going to work. Hope is not knowledge. Hope is, for me, rooted in faith. I just, I believe that promise despite all evidence to the contrary. And in a language we can understand, it's one of the deep failings that some of us have sometimes when we're overeducated is we we have a vocabulary that doesn't communicate. And so to find words that work this way, I guess one of the things I want to leave with a question, <laughs> can we trust even when we don't know? Can we find that? Um, we're, if we give up that endless search for answers and just rest in the arms of the divine. Can we do that? Can we allow ourselves to do that? Can we allow ourselves to be comforted even when we don't know? Living without answers and knowledge 
is very scary, but it is also where we find faith, in my view. You are listening to the Religica Theo Lab podcast in the Center for Ecumenical and Interreligious Engagement at Seattle University. 